Today, pun intended, it's time to look at what appears to be the most positive and upbeat song about hitting rock bottom, the Smashing Pumpkins, and the heartbreaking story behind their hit song, Today. Hi, I'm Andy Fenstermaker from the Fence Post Vinyl Channel. This is Poetic Wax, a series where I bring you stories from the history of bands, albums, and songs from within my vast record collection. I'm pulling out my original pressing of Siamese Dream, the sophomore album from the Smashing Pumpkins, to explore the song that really just started it all for me. In late May of 1991, the Smashing Pumpkins released Gish. It was their debut album produced by Butch Vig, who within a year would work on Nevermind by Nirvana. And a few years later, he joined the Scottish singer Shirley Manson to help form the band Garbage. That album, Gish, would help bridge the gap between the then mostly underground alt-rock scene and mainstream rock, though the majority of that nod needs to really go to Nevermind. Regardless, Gish would certainly ride its coattails as alt-rock exploded into massive cultural relevance. Gish wasn't an immediate commercial success, but it was certainly a step up from where the band was prior to its release. I mean, that's no surprise given it was their first album. Prior to Gish, they'd really only toured briefly, say maybe about a month, 20 days or so, mostly like small little trips out. But after its release, the Smashing Pumpkins toured pretty much straight for about 14 months, opening for acts like the Red Hot Chili Peppers and Pearl Jam. It was a grueling experience, much different than hitting the road today, which honestly can still be quite grueling. Discomfort was a thing. In the midst of their tour, something was happening in rock music, and it all came to a head on September 24, 1991. That day saw the release of Nirvana's Nevermind. The same day as Nevermind's release saw two other pivotal albums hit, Bad Moto Finger from Soundgarden and Blood Sugar Sex Magic from Red Hot Chili Peppers. A week earlier, there was Use Your Illusion 1 and 2 by Guns N' Roses, and one month prior to that, in mid to late August respectively, was Metallica's self-titled album, often referred to as the Black Album, and 10, the debut album from Pearl Jam. So there was this incredible momentum within the sphere of alt-rock, and in rock music in general. The pressure was on to deliver. Corgan and crew needed a follow-up that could surpass the success of Gish and meet the acclaim of literally everything else that was hitting the mainstream at the time. Despite releasing Gish four months prior to that date in September, the Smashing Pumpkins were often being touted as the next Nirvana. And that's where things turned a bit sour. <laughs> Returning to Chicago from their extensive tour and having generated buzz and momentum around Gish, the band was under immense pressure, and they very nearly imploded. Bassist R.C. Retsky and guitarist James Eha, who had been dating, were in the process of breaking up. Drummer Jimmy Chamberlain was kind of at the beginning of his well-publicized drug addictions, and frontman Billy Corgan slipped into what he often refers to as one of the worst songwriting slumps of his life. The months wore on. One, two, seven, eight. He was struggling with writer's block, a small but growing public persona, the pressure to meet the demand of the growing presence of mainstream alt-rock. And Corgan was also experiencing a very tumultuous personal crisis. Experiences and feelings that he had repressed from childhood were surfacing and coming up, causing all sorts of turmoil. I had locked everything away, thinking I'll never have to deal with this again. And suddenly I found myself confronted with all these demons I thought I locked away. And I entered into this very horrible period of my life. Removing the songwriter from him had stripped away his passion and his purpose. Blending in all of those things from childhood created an even greater crisis. Things were out of control, and he was at his breaking point. Add to that a split from his girlfriend of the time, and suddenly he was homeless, sleeping on Darcy's floor for a while and living for a bit in a parking garage. I lost the ability to function. I didn't want to go outside. I was eating like a pig and gaining weight. I couldn't write songs. 
He became obsessed with ending it all. This was Billy Corgan's rock bottom. Out of the depths of this despair, I sort of bottomed out, and it literally came down to a simple question, at least in my mind at the time. On one hand, he could pack it in and call it a day, as Kurt Cobain would do over a year later, and you know what that means. On the other hand, he could get used to it, as he would say, work and live and be happy. He would go on to joke, as you can see, I chose another form of death, which is rock and roll. Most people, myself included, hyper-focus on the positive aspects of today. Today is the greatest day I've ever known. Those lyrics are front and center. But continue and dig deeper into those lyrics and what comes after, and it gets dark. Fast. Can't live for tomorrow. Tomorrow's much too long. I'll burn my eyes out. At this point in my life, it's a positive song, Corgan says. It's about survival. In a now archived article on Blender, Corgan stated, I just thought it was funny to write a song that said today is the greatest day of your life because it can't get any worse. Listen to the demo for today and what you hear is quite different. It jumps straight into that powerful opening riff. In the studio, Corgan felt it needed a little something extra at the beginning, something before the song exploded with noise. It needed a powerful opening hook. At that point, we just started the song with the verse chord progression, which itself is pretty catchy because of the melody. I knew I had to come up with some sort of opening riff. Then, out of the blue, I heard the opening lick note for note in my head. That gentle guitar chime was the turning point for the track. Suddenly, I had this song that was starting out quiet and then got very loud. I could hear the shifts in the song as it progressed. The tension within the band was what gave them an edge. It's this volatile thing where they could just explode at any moment. Corgan, the control freak, was in full force during the recording of Siamese Dream. Chamberlain was too drugged out to perform most of the time, and, you know, sometimes he didn't even show up. And Retsky might need 20 or more takes to get a part out where Corgan, on her bass, just needed three. This certainly didn't help the temperament within the band. When I think of Siamese Dream, one of the first songs I gravitate towards is Today. It's what drew me to the band originally. And it was that powerful track that sparked my obsession with seeking out new music. I'm, I'm not alone there. Virgin Records, the Smashing Pumpkins label at the time, was obsessed with that song as well. They felt it could be the first single. And Corgan, on the other hand, well, he felt otherwise. I wanted Cherub Rock as the first single. They wanted Today. I mean, I created a monstrous, emotional piece of art an hour long, and the only thing people wanted to talk about was the song I wrote in 10 minutes. Corgan got his way, but only in the UK. When it was released in the States in October of 1993, Cherub Rock completely flopped. Today, though, entered the Billboard chart on Christmas. And it had a lot to do with MTV, thanks to the repeated plays of the music video, which featured an ice cream truck in the desert. And it propelled the band to stardom. I often credit the Smashing Pumpkins with igniting my passion for discovering new music. Back in 1993, my exposure to music was pretty much limited to what my parents played. That all changed when my late friend Justin, who succumbed to cancer, last fall, sadly, introduced me to a song during my freshman year of high school. That song was Today, and the band was The Smashing Pumpkins. The Smashing Pumpkins is one of those bands I cover every so often right here on my channel, on my Poetic Wax series. I'd love to know what story you'd love for me to cover about this band next. Speaking of, I recently took a look at the history of another hit song by the Smashing Pumpkins and the ultimatum that very nearly saw it erased from existence. Next, join me for another episode of Poetic Wax as I take a look at the Smashing Pumpkins' 1995 hit, 1979. I am Andy, this is the Fence Post Vinyl Channel, and I'll see you in that next video.